Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. Today I want to talk about grounding. I'm going to show you a ground map of a, a you know product. Let's say it has AC power coming in. We have an RF amplifier, circuit card, and a digital card, and an analog card. And we want to power them up, okay? So power supply guy might come in and say, hey, why don't we do it this way? And let me show you. And what you want to do is you want to show people how you're going to give them the power and how you want to run grounding, okay? I'm trying to get the glares off this thing. So, okay, AC power comes in. We're going to go through an EMI filter and then through the power supply. I'm only showing the block diagrams just enough to show the grounding, how we're going to run power and, you know, what the circuits are going to be referenced to, ground or return pass. Like, what's going to be the return pass? How are we going to do that? All right, so the input power, you know, we're going to have line neutron ground, okay? And the ground is going to be earth ground out there. And we know the service entrance, neutron ground are bonded together. So that way, if this, our product, let's say, is in this big metal box, maybe it's a rack. And we have this box, the power supply, in one metal box. And then we have three more metal boxes, like an RF amplifier, some analog circuitry, and some digital circuitry. And all these things are mounted into maybe a rack or something like that, okay? So we know that if we have a line voltage shorted to the metal chassis, we're gonna get a short to ground and it's gonna trip the breaker. So that's our safety ground and it's gonna carry that fault current. But as it comes into the product, it's gonna immediately go to a, a bolt. It's gonna be tied to a knee lug or you know that's an earth ground lug or whatever you want to call it but it's gonna be tied to chassis and so we're gonna show the chassis symbol because that is telling us what's happening we're tying that right to chassis but we're also showing that it's going into the EMI filter because we're gonna do some filtering and we're gonna do some common mode filtering so we need Y capacitors tied to uh, ground from line to ground and neutral to ground so that's why we have on this EMI card, we're showing a chassis ground because it's going to uh, send that current back that way. Okay. Then we have our power supply. And, you know, the power, the blue and orange, as it comes to the line and neutral, as it comes to the EMI filter, it's going to be passed on to the power supply, not the, not the ground. We're already done with that. We're going to pass the power into the power supply. And the power supply, this can be line filtered and neutral filtered at this point. So we could even show a return signal there if we want to. We could put primary ground there and primary and some other uh, ground here or something. If we wanted to show, if we're going to have enough circuitry tied to this, we might want to show a return path, uh, a ground symbol, what I'm trying to say. I mean, the reason we like to use these ground symbols is because we can place them, they're like global signals. We can place them around the circuit without having to run a line to everything, right? So that's kind of like why we like ground symbols. All right, so this is primary ground. And then we go through a transformer for our galvanic isolation for our secondary side. Now we have these three boxes over here. This box is going to be powered, the RF is going to be powered with the 8 volt output off the transformer. The analog will be powered with a 12 volt output off the transformer and the digital by a 5 volt. But then we'll use a little DC DC converter to get 3.3, maybe a, a linear regulator depending on the power level. And so we'll have uh, two voltages coming over here. But they'll have the same return path, they'll still be on digital return. You know, ground is what we keep on saying, but I, I like to get away from saying ground all the time because. It's it's all encompassing. It means everything. It brings a lot of confusion. But if we just say digital return, analog return, signal return, then we know what we're talking about. It's more descriptive, and our symbols show that on our schematics. And when we do our board layout, the the software knows everything connected to this gets connected. Everything connected to this gets connected here. So it's important as for our software as well, right? So, all right, so now what we have is we have these three things here, and the RF, I'm showing a chassis ground. Signal ground's coming over here 
but the RF, this little metal box here, it likes to have low impedance ground, so everything likes to be straight to the chassis and use the chassis as ground. That's the way it's typically done, but um, anyway, so that's why I'm showing the chassis there. Now, yeah, it's tight over here too, right? So now you're like, well, now you just shorted the primary and secondary together. Well, not really, because the current from this 8 volt that comes to power all this stuff, it's going to want to return back to the winding. This is the source of that 8 volts. Yeah, it's touching here, but it's only touching there. There's no path from this uh, point back to here, right? There's no, uh, there's no DC path. So the current flowing from this winding is only going to stay in this circuit and sure, if this circuit scattered all around the board, which it wouldn't be, but if it was, then yeah, it could, it could travel on some of these wires, which we wouldn't want it to do, obviously. But we would want to lay out our circuit card a lot like the schematics laid out. And this stuff would be, all this isolated stuff would be physically away from all this stuff. Now, sometimes power goes in the U-shape. Input comes in wraps around output goes out so if all these guys wrapped around this way you'd still have separation from those things physical separation so the currents would still want to stay in these loops here hopefully that makes sense now as far as galvanic isolation goes let's say we cut the power supply off right here okay and we take all these secondary windings the 8 volt 12 volt the 5 and the 3.3 we take all those wires let's say that's a connector 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 we take all those connectors short them all together and we get our high pot meter out we take one electrode and put it on that bunch of contacts and then we take these three things and we tie those together and we put our other high pot electrode on that and then we do a high pot test and we put high voltage basically it's like taking an ohm reading with your ohm meter except for you're doing it with high voltage and so that's really the difference and when you do that you you're checking to make sure this transform is not breaking down and you have an opto coupler you know having some feedback to the power supply saying how to regulate so i'm not showing that but this would be the isolation boundary maybe the opto coupler you draw right here and it's feeding back to this side all right so now you've and now what's that voltage set to it's a, typically a thousand volts plus two times working voltage. So let's say here in the US we got 120. So let's say the peak of that's 160, 160 ish. So you double that. So it's two times that working voltage. So it's uh, 320 plus a thousand volts. So it's 1300 volts. So we're going to high pot just around 1300 volts. Okay. Now, uh, and we make sure we don't break down. So then we know we have galvanic isolation between all our outputs to all the inputs. They're all isolated, okay? Then what we do is we want to check to make sure each one of these outputs is isolated from the other one. Now, in that case, we don't do the 1,000 volts plus the two times. We might, uh, there's different levels. You might do 100 volts or 500 volts or even 1,000 volts, but you'll check the isolation to make sure there's not breakdown between this winding and that winding. And really, you're checking the integrity of your transformer to make sure it's wound correctly, that it has a proper insulation. All right, so that way we don't have any shorting from the primary side to the secondary side and causing some, you know, high voltage hazard over here. All right, that's the idea. All right, now, now let's put these three boxes back, connect them back up with our cables. All right, if we do that, what we could do if we wanted is at this point we could take each one of these metal boxes and tie it to chassis, bond it to the metal. So all the metal is the same voltage potential. Well, now inside each one of those boxes we could take the chassis and, and tie it to the digital ground, like say in the digital card. We could take the digital ground and tie it to the chassis at one point. Just one point tie. We could do the same for the analog. Okay. The RF's a little bit different, but let's say the analog and digital. We could tie those to the metal chassis. 
because we certainly want all the metal boxes tied together. We want all the metal at the same potential. They're all bonded together. All the metal boxes are bonded together. But now whether or not we take our returns and time to chassis, we could do that if we want to. All right, so the reason you might want to tie uh, your secondaries to your output is just so they're not floating around. So if it, there's a potential that somebody could touch your five volts, you know, if five volts is floating around, it could float hundreds of volts up. Now, it'd be kind of, you know, a static charge almost because, you know, you're not going to get a lot of current out, but you don't really need a lot of current. It'd be a shock. And anyway, so just to uh, make it a little bit safer for humans, you could tie each one to chassis. Well, now you're thinking like, oh, now you're shorting it to your primary, but you're really not because... Again, if this 5 volt winding here, or the 3.3, this current wants to travel back to the winding. It, it cannot go through chassis and get back to here somehow. It has to, if it goes to t chassis, just like, well, there's a dead end there. Um, but I, I've got a return path back to this end of the transformer winding, and I'm going around this way if I'm saying conventional flow. Okay, same thing with the 12 volts. Now the 12 volts, it can't come to the chassis and flow through this secondary winding either because there's no DC path from this winding to that winding. Even if you connect one point, you're only connecting one point, right? So you're not causing a problem. It's kind of like that rule where uh, if you're working around electricity, you put one hand in your pocket. If you can only touch thing, you know, if your feet are isolated and you touch something with one hand, you're floating, right? So current doesn't have a path through you to anything else if you're isolated, right? So it's the same thing here. If you're touching the chassis with one hand, there's no path. There's no other path to, because you have to complete a path, a loop, to get current to flow, right? You have to have at least one series path. And if you don't have that, you don't have any current flow. So when you're just touching the chassis and you're isolated everywhere else, you're okay to do that. And the reason you do that, it's kind of like throwing an anchor. It's like a bunch of boats sitting off a dock and the water's doing all this kind of stuff. If all the boats have the same length of, let's say, rope or chain to the anchor, the, the boats are all going to kind of sit there and, you know, they, they might move a little bit, but they're all going to... Basically, they're not going to bounce as high as waves are. They're going to be held to a certain level, right? I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever used that analogy before. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's just an acre spot, okay? And it's just to tie everything to one spot. Now, you could have a case where, which could be common actually, where... The analog and the RF wants to talk to a digital card, maybe an I, I2C, I squared C, you know, CAN bus or something. And if they do, you could use isolated chips so they're still isolated. Or you could just let these things have a one, uh, one point tie, say the digital to analog. So the analog and digital might be tied at one point. So a current could flow through the 12 volts, come through here. Once go down to the I2C, and one side of the I2C is going to have uh, current from the 12 volt side. The other side is going to have current from the 5 volt side. And you know, if there is any crosstalk there, it's only right there at that one point. So that's why you have a grounding map. So you go, wow, geez, the digital guy wanted to have I2C, and we all have different grounds. How are we going to pull that off? So then you consider use an ice age chips or just hard tying them at one spot here at the output. If you only have a single tie, the current in the circuitry here is still going to circulate and do all the stuff it wants to do. It's not gonna really add a ground loop. Uh, it's possible that it does, so that's when placement of the I2C chips would be important is to place them on parts where the current doesn't want to go that way. It's, it's better, you know, it's gonna to wanna to travel in the tightest loop it can. I mean, so if you're trying to monitor the voltage of the input over here, and then definitely you'd want to go through an isolation chip. And you wouldn't want to run wires uh, 
and you want to be careful where you run your traces so you don't couple things from one side to the other because you can have galvanic isolation but you can still couple magnetically and and introduce noise into signals so you don't want to do that so there's no current flow in the chassis except for the exception of these white caps to this and that's really the only place you have any current flowing in your chassis because you really don't want any current in your chassis now up here in the RF he's kind of a special case because all this circuitry wants really low impedance meaning it's going to travel as short as it can so all this RF stuff is going to be located it's going to be located right here all that current flow in the RF stuff it's not going to travel around ground loops and that kind of thing because it wants to be right here tight and the 8 volt where the winding that's generating the voltage for this is right here so everything's going to stay right here okay now if you did something and place this RF card down here and cables cross each other then again you're getting into that coupling thing that's something different that's not uh, DC uh, paths you're connecting well it could be I guess depending on how you did it but most likely it's going to be a coupling problem so you're, you want things co-located and tight so hope that makes sense hope that was a good example to kind of show you the different ground symbols and how you might use ground symbols to to show the return pass for circuits because other than this one chassis and earth ground all this other stuff is um, just showing return paths it's their identifiers for what return path you're on okay primary return path you got a power loop right here secondary you got one here here's another secondary it just happens to be called analog because it's different from this one digital it's different than these so you know that you got your return path here return path here and return path here so and none of these currents are going to mix together even if you touch the chassis down now if you tie the analog to the digital so that they can talk together and you don't want to use an isolated say a communication bus you want to just tie them together because you're okay with uh maybe the i2c communications happening over here and you're okay with that current circling here and, you, and there's no case where uh, current somewhere else in the circuit is going to come down there and and find that as another loop then you're okay now if you set a temperature sensor say up here on the RF circuit and you're reading it down here that line if it crosses over all this stuff then you know you those are considerations you have to make and you have to be careful on on how you make those kind of connections so uh, sometimes uh, temperature sensors are a problem okay especially the kind of temperature sensors that tie your chassis so those, those things can be problems because now you're actually taking current from chassis and flowing it down here so you can read it so yeah that those things can become problems okay so always be careful with any kind of device you're connecting to chassis that has current flow in it uh, electric motors let's say the analog is just motors or fans great to have isolated power to fans and motors so you're not taking that noisy power and running it across your digital stuff or your RF stuff okay alright guys hey thanks for watching hope that made sense and I want to give two thumbs up I had to put the board down give two thumbs up to my patrons really appreciate you guys uh, I think it's awesome and oh you can become a patron the links down below and I got a link below for the grounding video I did just before this one. i probably going to post this one in the morning. So I posted the grounding video today. So one day apart. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.